All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our fiscal year end meeting for 2024. This is going to be for USAS and for inventory. So uh, we're doing it a little different this year. <laughs> uh, we we kind of um, took a look after last year and we decided to try something a little bit different. Um, usually what we do is we do uh, at least USAS and then USPS kind of in the same day where we kind of um, do that and split it up. But, you know, we notice that's kind of a lot. I know that these meetings can be pretty long um, and there's a lot to get through, you know, um, with these different checklists and everything. Now, USAS and inventory together aren't too bad. So what we're trying is doing those both together. You're stuck with me all day. Um, I'm going to be the one doing both of these sessions. So uh, what we'll do is we'll go through USAS first, and then we'll take a little break and we'll go through the inventory presentation. I don't know that we will actually be nine to noon. That sounds kind of long for uh, what I'm thinking as far as like what I know that I wanna go over. So um, we'll see though, you know, sometimes I can, can talk and if you have questions along the way, of course, um, please ask those either in the chat or feel free to unmute and um, and ask away. And uh, yeah, okay, just making sure we got everyone in here from the waiting room, got my notes pulled up, okay. All right, so where are we at? Let's go back to our homepage real quick. And um, okay, so from our homepage on the wiki, I'm just scrolling all the way down to our section for um, meetings and trainings. Just one second. I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm here. So, um, <laughs> sorry about that. So, okay, so once we get to the SSDT meetings and trainings page, what we're going to do is um, look for this section right here, which is the year end meeting materials. And um, the 2024 IDC fiscal year end page is here. So, what we do is we update these kind of every year. So, these will rotate through when we get to calendar year end. This will switch to um, calendar year end 2024. All right, so when we get here, then this is the page we started off looking at. This is our year-end materials. Um, this is gonna be organized with both the stuff that we have for today for our USAS and our inventory. And then also your USPS information is here. Um, what we do is we update these like as we go. So um, for today, we're gonna be looking at the presentation. This checklist is in the, in the documentation in the wiki. Um, but this is, you know, basically always in the wiki. So what we do is we have these like updated um, dates on this page because each year as we go through and prepare for the new year, you know, some things may change slightly and we review and update that. So whenever these materials are updated for the year, we um, stamp them with a date. Some of these things like for use as like this hasn't changed. There's no change to this process in the last couple of years. So that date is back in 22, which is okay. That just means that if you already have looked at that document, it hasn't changed. <laughs> so um, the other reason we do this um, is, you know, say something changes with something related to fiscal year after we have this meeting, if we have to update, you know, this, the presentation or the checklist for any reason, we'll update the dates too. So, so just a note on um, what we're seeing there. And all right. So I think that takes us into uh, the presentation. So again, we're kicking off with USAS. All righty. Let me, um, we want to, there we go. I feel like it a little bit better. We can't see that. Okay. So um, to get started here, our very first page is uh, our very first slide is what we just talked about. So this, um, if you happen to just uh, save this presentation 
and you want to go back and look at any of those other resources, this has a link to that page that we just talked about there uh, with the meetings and training, so you can get to that fiscal year end page. The first thing we're going to talk about for USAS is things to consider prior to fiscal year end. So these can really, you can really be like starting considering these um, anytime before the end of the fiscal year. Districts are probably already working on um, multiple of these things, closing out all possible purchase orders so that, you know, um, and making sure that basically they're keeping track of um any encumbered amounts, are those gonna be spent before the end of the year? And if those aren't gonna be spent before the end of the year, then they may wanna close those purchase orders so that it doesn't carry over um, a prior year encumbrance because then that counts towards the next year's like expendable figure. So that's something that um, the districts are probably keeping tabs on. This is a link to our FAQ. And uh, let me click this so we can open this. This is a link to our FAQ, and then um, this should go to our purchase order section. So, sorry, it was our purchase orders. And so there are some notes in here about, um, you know, how it's a purchase order that is paid on be closed, um, if it has zero remaining closed, and so some different ways, as along with other links, you know, to um, relevant spots for how to close purchase orders. Uh, usually there's a couple, there, there's two main um, routes. Uh, they could update the um, last invoice that happened from partial to full. If that's in an open period, that's a pretty easy way and simple to go. Um, or they could create a cancel invoice and close out the remaining encumbrances. And then that could be dated in the current period. So those are the options there. Um, reviewing old outstanding disbursements. You know, we've had this one on this presentation for a while, and I'm not really sure um, how often this happens anymore. Uh, so I was looking at this in our FAQ. I looked it on here just in case because it is still a good tip. Um, but where we have this, where we used to get a lot of questions on it, was related to imported memo checks. And so that was like imported from classic. And so um, basically the, the need for this, the positive out of this is the outstanding disbursement report that's going to run for any checks that are outstanding. So are not um, reconciled or are not void. And then it'll be based on like the dates for the current period. So if you have um, old checks that were never reconciled, then they're gonna show on that report, which kind of doesn't help seeing the things that are actually outstanding. So. I mean, this seems like it's probably more like a one-time process, but if you have districts that haven't done this and maybe they don't use this report and they could, this is um, something that could be done. Uh, you know, and then also, I'm not really sure what the each district's process is uh, re with regularly reconciling. Like, I, I think that they do, but um, I'm not sure if they always, um, you know, go through and reconcile everything. So there could be cleanup, you know, that, that could be possible there too. So uh, so reviewing old disbursements is the next one. Adding custom monthly report bundles. So uh, that's another thing. If there are uh, reports that they um, want to have sent out either to themselves or to um, building staff maybe on a monthly basis, Fiscal year, uh, fiscal year end could be a good time to start getting that organized to set up um, monthly reports for like say the next year. Um, so this is a link to our wiki. This gives all the information on setting up a custom monthly bundle. Um, again, that doesn't have to happen on fiscal year end. This is just, just some ideas here. And then the uh, the next one that I have here is uh, maintenance of effort. So there is a budget summary maintenance of effort version. And um, here, let me click this one. Let's see, I think this is going to go there. Yeah. Okay. So um, basically, oh, we were there. Um, there we go. Okay. So this produces a budget summary report containing the accounts involved in maintenance of effort. And here's a list of like what specific expenditure data is pulled for this report. 
So this report is um, in the software. Uh, it's in our um, template reports. Budget summary MOE here, let me just do this. Our budget summary MOE. And um, let me go, you know what? Getting ahead, let me go to my next slide because I know I got information on it. Um, so why is this important? So prior to funding, ODE annually compares the district's local or state and local expenditures to ensure that the district budgets and expends at least the same amount of funds as the previous year. So basically this report, um, you can review the expenditures prior to these being reported. So this is something um, when they do the period H submission through the data collector, this is one of the things that's being looked at. So this gives kind of like a preview of um, which accounts are being looked at for this. So this budget summary uses a special account filter called SSDT MOE. So when you run this actual template report, it has that written in. If there are other reports that they would then wanna see, like say that they wanna do like a budget account activity, um, this account filter is in every instance, like they didn't have to go create this. This just would exist. And so they could use this on other reports um, if you wanted to see the exact account um, set up or if there's something else, you know, if they're digging into this and want this, if they could run. Uh, you know, I feel like I went into this a little bit um, because we have this slide to go over, but uh, we're also going to be having a session in a couple weeks um, for USAS and we're going to talk um, more about uh, things like that. So I know we have MOE on the list talking about grants and then we're going to talk about the period age and, and balancing back to their software. So that's a little preview. <laughs> um, kind of the basics if districts are looking at this before their fiscal year end. Um, but uh, we will, we will, we do have plans to talk more about that. Um, okay. Uh, so other things that they can do now prior to fiscal year end, a uh, verifying data, district and building information, making sure accounts are valid, looking at the OPUs for the district, and then things like preparing budgets and revenue estimates and preparing requisitions for next fiscal year. So um, as we go through these, then we're gonna take a look at actually each of these things. Um, a couple of these things uh, that I mentioned at first, like the district and building information is used for the ODE EMIS reporting. So. Um, if I go to our core menu, you know what, let me zoom in a little bit. If I go to our core menu and organization, this is where the district's information is kind of set up their basics, their name, their address, their phone number. And if we scroll down right here, we have these last couple of fields. So we have the um, central office square footage and ITC IRN. Um, the, the, um, I'm sorry. The central office square footage does still get reported with the uh, period H reporting. ITC IRN used to, it doesn't anymore. Uh, so uh, let's go to this, make sure I have this right. Yeah, ITC IRN is no longer required in the EMIS extract. So doesn't hurt anything to have that filled out. It can be nice for reference, but that's not really being used for anything. So you don't really have to worry if that's blank, you know, if they choose to leave that blank or, you know, it's not required. But making sure that uh, that central office square footage is filled out is a good double check. Uh, generally, that probably will not be changing year to year, and it, it doesn't um, go away on this page at any point. But, you know, if a district does move uh, buildings or something for their central office, the, they're probably not thinking with, with all of that happening to come in here and change it. So um, it's a good end of year thing. Uh, similarly, under the periodic menu, we have the building profiles. So again, this is information that is related to what gets reported um, to uh, ODE with the period H. And um, what they have in here is basically the IRN and they can put a description for each one of their buildings at their district. 
they put in their square footage and then they have their percent. So their transportation percentage, their lunchroom percentage. And basically you wanna make sure that these equal 100%, which I see that they do not. So um, let's create a building here. Make one up. We don't have a high school. So let's see. And then 40, 50, okay, so we need 25%. Oops. Uh, so we create that. So again, this is a one-time setup. They're probably not coming in here and creating uh, buildings every year, but um, if they have these set up, say they did like close a school building, um, you know, if they downsized or if they added a new building, they may need to come in here and um, add that one to the list. And then because these percentages, so the transportation and lunchroom percentage all together for all of their buildings needs to equal 100 because that's sort of um, like illustrating like how those are spread out across their buildings. And so uh, they will get an error in the data collector if they don't. So um, if they say they added a building and then they need to come in and edit the other ones to make sure that those uh, all still match, they can. Um, oops, sorry. And then let's see. Okay. So then we have a report to district building information. So, um, after they do that and update it, um, they come to the report manager. We have district building information. Sorry, I, with the zoom in, I should remember just to filter <laughs> instead of trying to scroll here. All right, so let's run this. And um, boom, so we have a little report and it's it's nothing, nothing fancy, but um, that at least gives us something if they want to, you know, put this in a little folder to save or even just view it this way, have somebody sign off on it. Um, there's a nice report there. You know what? Let's go back to the um, grid. And I know we have the report from here too. I thought one of them, yeah. Okay. So this one has a total on it. So that's what I'm thinking about. So if they have a lot of buildings and they're trying to um, work with these percentages and uh, make sure that they equal 100. So again, that was just right from the grid. I did the report and I didn't have to change anything. And then that shows um, the figures like with a total too. So uh, this would be the one that's a little bit easier for um, kind of when they're entering, making sure that it's a, a 100. <laughs> okay. Um. So that's a good thing just to review, uh, basically kind of, you know, pre-closing, make sure that, that everything is set there. Another thing is the SSDT account validation report. So this ensures the district has no invalid account dimensions prior to using the data collector to check for level one um, or two errors. So there are, um, basically certain guidelines with some of the account codes as far as um, how they should be set up. Uh, if there is like um, codes that maybe used to be valid that are no longer valid um, or some codes require like a certain level of detail. Like if it has this function, then it needs to have a subject. I'm not sure if that's exactly one, but it's stuff like that where it's like sometimes there are just certain parameters that specific codes need to meet. And so here's an example here. Oh, let me, let me actually zoom in on this a little bit. So here's like a an example report here where it'll say like this fun code is not valid or this is not a valid function code. And those are all sort of written in um, the software. We keep track of things um, through, you know, with ODE changes, with AOS changes. Um, and so that can be, basically found by this report if they have any accounts 
that um, have certain, that, that don't have valid um, parameters. So uh, what they can do is run this account to review it um, before fiscal year end. And if there are any accounts that um, have, that have incorrect, you know, that are invalid basically, then uh, they can use account change to, well with amounts. So if it doesn't have an amount in it, it's okay. Um, but if it has an amount associated with it, then it's going to pull for the reporting. So the amounts need to be uh, changed over to a valid account and they can use account change. So here, here are a couple more examples of EMIS errors. We saw the like not a valid fund and function code. Uh, this one receipt code is not at a valid level of detail. Um, does it also look at function code is not a bell level of detail? Yes. Yeah. So these are just examples, but, um, yeah, if there, there are other ones that I've definitely seen. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Look at, okay. And I, and I got this on my next slide too. <laughs> we carry these year to year. So, you know, I know I didn't just type these up. So I don't remember. Uh, I wasn't sure if I had that in here, but. I love it when my PowerPoint backs me up. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so yeah, here we, here we go, right here, function object and receipt must be defined at higher level of detail. And then like some requirements, like this is the one I was kind of thinking of earlier. ODE requires a subject or an instructional level to be entered for this function or object. ODE requires an OPU to be entered for this function or object, which this one I think we've seen before. This one started popping up, it's probably been like, I don't know, more than five years now, but <laughs> during my time back with the IDC, I remember it was new <laughs> at one point. It wasn't always there and it was um, throwing people off. So, uh, you know, of course, like it's going to have an OPU, but like all accounts will have one. But sometimes if it's all zeros, that's district wide. And so something like this, like, for example, is, you know, they're trying to to see how expenses are dispersed. They're using the accounts to sort of make, uh, sort of gather information about, you know, what the district's spending. And then they also have the information for like, what teachers are associated with the building, what students are associated with the building. Um, so with like the OPU, they're saying, okay, so now we wanna know what building that this expense is related to. Um, however, it they could have it as all zeros. Like some of these in the data collector, so we have like level one or level two fatal. Some of these can be warnings, you know, where they could choose like, yeah, just leave it district wide. And then it spreads the expense over all of them. So, uh, so really what this is, when you're using this account validation report, it's a tool to help prevent the later errors. It's a tool to help give them a heads up on things that they may need to clean up. Ultimately, if they didn't run this and just went straight to the data collector, that's going to give them the actual warnings and errors there. And then they could still come back and clean it up. So, you know, this is basically a tool. It's not you're, It's not that the validation report is like the end all be all, right? Like it's just basically like a little preliminary step that they can kind of do to prepare. Um, and then, you know, on that, let me uh, go here too. So the other thing I, I mentioned earlier, but I don't think I have a specific like screenshot in the um, presentation. Uh, another thing, just the OPUs. So this is set up within the software where if they needed to check, um, you know, their OPU codes and then like what IRN is associated with that as well, what building um, that would be set up in their software on this page from the core menu, OPUs. Okay. And then this is just saying, so if they have invalid errors, um, must be cleaned up using the account change under utilities. So next, this is similar, um, still talking about uh, the account records. The cash record is reported via EMIS with the financial age collection. And the category defines the fund special cost center describing what type of fund it is for EMIS. Um, so some information related, like we have this cash record. So this is the general, this is a screenshot from like the general guidelines, you know, it's, uh, has the fund, it has a special cost center, but, um, 
a couple of these things, if you notice, this says like, this element is not submitted to ODE, fund type is not submitted to ODE. So the basics of the cash account, like their cash accounts are being um, pulled over, like what cash accounts they have and exist, fund special cost center. However, as of last year, uh, the brief description or like the fund type or EMIS fund categories is what they were known as. Those are not, um, those are not reported anymore. So um, that's something just like, you know, it's it's optional. We are keeping that in the software uh, for like a drop down, but it's not something that they're required to report. Will you be changing any references to ODE in your documentation to DEW? Uh, you know what, Carol, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what DEW is. Let me know. Um, oh, okay. So, you know what? I lied. I do have this in here. ODE changed their name to DEW. Oh, well, I hadn't heard that yet. Um, so, you know what? Uh, we'll see, possibly. That that does make sense. I know that our developers have been talking to them about some of the other changes uh, for the upcoming year. So, I'm sure uh, that... Um, Probably it just hasn't <laughs> made it to me yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let me make a note because uh, yeah, I'm sure uh, we should probably do that. <laughs> My notebook out here anyway, should have had this. Well, thank you. Department of Education Workforce. ODE split, license part is still ODE. Okay. You've been updating your documents to account for it. Okay. Okay, well, we'll look into that. Perfect. So our, <laughs> sorry, not to sidetrack, but are they referring to it like DEW or are they saying like do? <laughs> you know, are we are we using the letters when we say it? <laughs> um. All right. So this slide is uh. This uh, slide is about the OPU, uh, which I had showed. You've been seeing the E event, everything you missed related lately. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> um, all right, so then, uh, so this is, this was the OPUs that, that I, we went and looked at this page, so. Um, and we have uh, just talking about budgeting appropriations. So uh, this is another step. You know, we're still in this preliminary part. They've probably been working on these. We did our budgeting training back in um, back in February. So uh, if um, you want more information on that, that training definitely goes through all of the steps. Um, you know, we have this we have this walkthrough for um, creating proposed amounts for the next fiscal year. Uh, that's in the useful procedures or from the budgeting page. But basically this process is they're gonna start gathering, you know, what their budgeting amounts are gonna be for next year, uh, getting those worked out with their um, building and departments, get those all into the scenario so that they can push those forward to the proposed amounts and then be able to eventually apply those for the new year. Now, once they are in that next year proposed area, or once they're, I'm sorry, once they're in the proposed amounts grid, then they'll be in um, the next year proposed, it'll be a next year proposed amount. So they could also start entering requisitions as well. Um, it, you know, if it's in the next year proposed, that's when they could uh, use it for budget checking if they're set up for that. Um, to enter requisitions, the posting period must be open for July, so they need to uh, create July 2024 and have it open. However, it does not need to have to be the, I'm sorry, it does not have to be the current uh, posting period. So, um, you know, basically just creating it and then staying current in whatever month they're actually in. Uh, and then they would be able to to start, uh, their staff can start entering requisitions for the new year. Um, I believe if they enter requisitions through a third party, I believe uh, as well, they can um, they can start doing that, but they may need some uh, setup with their third party. But I think these two things would still apply because when they push it over, it needs to have July 
uh, in order to have this a July date. So, so general guidelines there um, to start that process. And then we're on to the month end closing. Let me zoom back out again on this. So for the month end closing, um, basically, you know, when they get to the end of the year, this part is similar to their every month. So they're going to enter all their transactions for the current month. They're going to reconcile USAS with their bank records. So the uh, bank reconciliation procedure um, and making sure that their book bal balances what they have in the bank. Um, and then generating the cash summary report and the financial detail report. So these two we have on here mainly as the example because the cash summary is going to show everything expended, everything received, where their fund balance is. Um, and that's going to show the totals from their accounts. Um, and then the SSDT financial detail report is going to list out all of the transactions and that's going to end in what was expended and what was received as a total of transactions for the year. So the expended and the received amounts on these two reports should balance. Um, huge note when using that SSDT financial detail, especially this is going to be run for the entire year. Make sure you're using that canned version because that's going to run way quicker. Um, and then, so the detail report maybe run for the month in order to compare month to date totals. So if you did then run like financial detail just for the month, that cash summary also has month to date totals on it um, that can balance. So if those two agree, cause that's gonna be within your software. So first you balance to the bank within your software, then you're making sure that all of your account totals, all of the totals stamped on those accounts match what the actual running total is of all of the transactions for the year, then good to move on. Any other reports that they might wanna save for their month or fiscal year end, um, they can run and review. You know, Again, this is just their regular closing process. When they're gonna close, just like normal, their um, monthly reports are gonna run and send to the archive. And then, um, you know, we have this note in here, wait until the bundle is complete before closing another month. So if you have districts that maybe don't close every single month and they leave months open, like we have seen some that leave like either all of them open for the fiscal year or, you know, half a year or that sort of thing. Like if you do have a district that is, you know, at this point in the year going through and closing multiple, um, pace that. Because if they go through and close them all and then those monthly bundles are all running one on top of each other, that could be a lot on the system. So our recommendation is to wait until, you know, the bundle is complete before closing another month. They could see that in the job scheduler. They could see it running through there. Um, actually, you know what? That one runs with the SSDT. So if you're, so you, you at the ITC could see it in the job scheduler, but the district may not be able to, um, but they can see in the file archive when those reports are uh, coming in the report. And I have the time. I don't know why I'm going off track. Reports can be viewed under utilities file archive. So they can see, you know, once that month is populated in there, then um, they can go ahead and close the next one. Again, that's just if they're in the situation where they don't um, close as they go. So um, if you do not want to run a report bundle for a posting period, then within the report bundle manager, there is a checkbox that could be unchecked to disable the bundle. Okay. All right, let's see. Okay, here we go. So now we're going to talk about the fiscal year end closing. And um, we have a couple more things related to uh, what gets reported for the period age uh, reporting. So under periodic, we also have the, um, I'm sorry, uh, cash reconciliation. So this is in here uh, for them to use. Some districts use this every month. Some districts do not. Uh, but basically what they would do is they can come in here, they choose the period, and then they can enter in um, the information here. And there's a different section uh, for each. Ultimately, at the end, this pulls the total fund balance. And so what they have entered needs to end up balancing to what their fund balance is that would be on like a cash summary. And um, this 
they even if they don't do it all year long they do need to do one for uh and sorry i don't have june open in this um instance but they need to do one for june because that information is going to go with their period h reporting so if they don't do it um every month they just you know once a year come in here and do it Um, good question, Michelle. We're going to get to that on the next page and then I'll answer that question as well. Uh, the other thing that we have in this periodic menu is civil proceedings. And so, um, this is another one that just goes with that English extract. And so they would come in here if they had any civil proceedings, enter the fiscal year, um, and then enter the relevant information and save this up. If they don't have any, they don't have to enter anything here. Uh, our next slide is about the federal assistance. So federal assistance is no longer required for EMIS reporting. So um, this is something previously like that you would do along with like the cash summary, along with the civil proceedings. Like that was one of these steps that we would always talk about at fiscal year end of like, go in, they need to enter these figures. Those are going to be pulled in the EMIS extract with their period age reporting. So at this point, it's not required anymore for EMIS. Um, so these steps are no longer needed prior to running their fiscal year and close or their EMIS extract. So all the things that we usually talk about it for at fiscal year end are no longer needed. Um, we had actually talked to um, ODE and uh, AOS. We had um, talk, talked with them about, you know, it no longer being needed to see if there were like other things um, you know, other requirements for it. And um, due to our digging, um, we hadn't heard. So we uh, had removed it from the software at one point based on that feedback. Now, then we had some additional feedback from you at the ITCs, from your districts. Um, we sent out some information, you know, we sent out some, like a question about it, I'm sure you remember. And uh, what we found is that districts were actually using this to keep track of the information for their federal schedules and they would give these to their auditors. So that is, they don't have to do that, but basically we added the pages back because we found that they wanted to do that. It was an easy way to compile the information instead of them keeping it in a spreadsheet. And then like, so basically it was like the purpose of what this was originally in the software for was like, they would have this information collected and then they could enter it in here, but but then because it was so easy to enter in there, my understanding is that, uh, you know, since since it was uh, a convenient place that they would have it already, they were also using that for their federal schedule reporting. So uh, that's cool, you know, that sometimes that happens where it's like maybe that wasn't the intended use in the software, but that's great that they had another way that they were using this that was convenient for them. So these pages are still back in the software. They're under periodic. Uh, they work the same way as previous. So federal assistance summary is just creating the year. So you they come in here and do whatever the year end, um, whatever year this is for. And then um, when you come into federal assistance detail, you can create the record and um, pick pick based on you know the federal assistance summary that exists and enter in their um, information, grant title, cash account amounts, et cetera. So that still works how it did. Um, now, th because this is not being included in like the EMIS extract or anything, it's not really on like a specific timeline. Like this connects to whatever year they choose when they add it. So they could do this before fiscal year end, they could do this after fiscal year end. They really could do this at any point. Um, whatever is convenient for them now. Um, however, Michelle brings up a good point for the fiscal year end report bundle, the documentation online still lists the federal assistance detail and summary. Will those reports be included and in still in the bundle? Um, that's a good question. And I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. Let me, let me just check real quick. Uh, I believe that we did not take them out. Um, and I think since the districts still wanted to use those reports, we may not. I'm just I'm doing a quick check on the fly. We're doing it live. Yeah, I don't see. I, 
because I think so basically I think what happened is I think we were going to eventually take them out um so when it was taken out of the software but then having districts say they were using it and, and I don't believe we had taken them out yet uh let's double check our report um bundles too so uh if you have districts that are like no longer going to use that then those reports will be included and they'll just be blank but um wrong page uh but if they do enter something in there for the year then it would be included so oh wait maybe we did take those out okay okay Hmm. Yeah, this is a fiscal. Okay. All right. So maybe we need to review our documentation then. We must have uh, missed the uh, the JIRA issue where they took us out. Hang on. Yeah, because that would be fiscal year. Okay. All right. Well, uh, just kidding. So when they, so, uh, well, I guess this is, well, the point I was going to make when I thought maybe they were still in there is that maybe that's a reason for them to enter them before the fiscal year end. Uh, but since it doesn't go with the automatic bundle, they could essentially enter those at any time they want and then just generate the reports on the fly for them. I mean, if you have a district that does want to have them saved in the archive, you can always send, you know, um, a custom bundle. But, uh, but yeah, so let, we'll review that. Amanda, when yes. you were in that fiscal year end bundle, can you grab the scrolly thing and scroll down to see if there were more? You know, I was trying to maybe uh see the little one. Oh, yeah. it's not letting you pull it down. <laughs> no, it's not here. Uh let's do this. You know what? Okay, there we go. Oh wait, they are in there. See? Okay. <laughs> oh gosh. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so <laughs> that's so funny well I'm glad that you thought that too because I was trying to click that originally and then I was like hmm, I guess this is it <laughs> but all right all right so uh this makes more sense oh my gosh hang on I need more copy okay so I guess this makes more sense because like I said we're, usually when they take something out we have the JIRA issue for it and then we'll get that so that we can update the documentation so it's still in the documentation because it's still in here so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so basically, again, what I'm saying still applies here. If they don't want to enter these anymore in the software, or if they don't enter them before they close their year, then these will just be blank reports in there, and it doesn't hurt anything. Um, again, both the, um, the fields, like the data and the reports, like what this is always going to run on is what you're seeing in these grids. Let's go back there. And um, so when you look at this, this specifically is tied to a fiscal year end. So at any point in time, they could be in 2025, they don't have to reopen periods, they don't have to, you know, change current periods or anything like this, these reports will strictly run just on whatever year they're picking. So, um, so it's like, you know, um, if they do continue this as part of their year-end process. They totally can. And then that'll run and be included in there. And if they don't, it's no big deal. So, so yeah, so that's where the, those are at. So we kind of put this in here um, as a, as a reminder. Um, but yeah, no longer required for the reporting. Okay. All right. So from there we have, um, make sure the EMA soap service configuration under system configuration is updated to reflect the fiscal year the district is reporting. So this is going to be uh, system configuration. And EMA soap service configuration right here. So we want to update this. This is a good step to check at fiscal year end and make sure that that is going to be for the year that they're going to um, be reporting next for period H. So, so I mean, you could update this now. This may have been updated after, um, like after they finished their period H reporting the previous year. Basically, you just want to make sure that this step is done before they do the the SIF extract, the SIF pull for their data. And then, um, so these next two slides are regarding setting up the SOAP service. So, you know, this these are kind of here for reference. Um, 
I'm not going to read through all of these. Pretty much, you, you probably already have this set up um, for your districts. If there is like, um, you know, if you have like new instances that are being set up for any reason, this is something that you may need to configure. But basically, this is how you're connecting the data collector to USAS. Um, and once you have this set up, this setup would just stay set up year to year. So you don't have to go in and do this every time um, for districts that are already set up. Okay, so now with that, there are two ways that the data collector, there's two ways per period age that the information is being gathered from USAS. The first one is the EMIS extract. And the EMIS extract is going to include just some of these like miscellaneous items. So the cash reconciliation, the civil proceedings, the district and building information. Um, so those are the things that we just looked at, right? Like we looked at and said they can preliminary go in here and do these. So after all of those things have been entered for the year, they would go in and do this EMIS extract. And this is right under the extracts, EMIS. And that's really simple, pick the year and generate the file. And then that gets uploaded uh, manually into their data collector. The other part, the other part is the SIP agent. So um, that'll pull the other period age files, cash, expenditure, revenue accounts, account data, and OPUs. So basically that is then gonna go look at the configuration that we just did. So, you know, that said, look at fiscal year 24. So um, it's going to go when they actually do the SIF pull in the data collector, it'll go look at their accounts for fiscal year 24 and pull over the account information. So, um, so that's kind of how it's collecting all of their financial data together in order to um, do the reporting. All right. All right, so then we are on our way with our um, fiscal year end, um, you know, uh, fiscal year end close. Uh, this is the part where manually run and review any reports not included in the report archive. If they have certain reports that they like to run at fiscal year end and they want to save, they can totally do that. Um, fiscal year report bundle will automatically run when the period is closed. And um, okay, so this last note, for if they have custom report bundles scheduled. So wait until the bundle is complete before changing the current posting period to a new period. If there are custom report bundles that are scheduled to run either with their month or um, fiscal period close. So, uh, and then once those complete reports can be viewed under the utilities file archive. I know that we had this question come up, especially if you have some larger districts so when these bundles are running for fiscal year end, the fiscal year end bundle has reports that are for, for the entire year. Like it's running a budget account activity, a financial detail for like July 1 through June 30th. Those can be very large reports. It can take some time. If you have a district that's got a lot of transactions in a year, those are going to be pretty big. The bundles will continue to run and um, process those reports in the background. Now, if this is just the standard SSDT reports, then um, those in, in the SSDT bundles, it's okay if the current period changes to the next period. Um, it's only if they have like custom bundles that they're sending out to like their building staff, those run based on the current period. So that's where they'd want to like Okay, I'm in June. If I have custom bundles, then I want to make sure those process before I change it to July or else they're going to run based on July, which is what you don't want. Um, last year, when I talked to those of you at the ITC that had districts that had like really had um, really big reports that were running, I don't believe that they had custom bundles. So if your district does not have custom bundles, they're just running like the um, fiscal year end bundle, June close June, that starts processing, that's gonna run. You can go ahead and change the current period to July so it doesn't have to hold them up. So if that is still running in the background, if it's an SSDT bundle, it's okay to move forward. They don't have to hold up their whole process for a long running report. So something to keep in mind there. 
And then here's a list of what's in that fiscal year end report bundle. So like I mentioned, we have, you know, budget account activity report. Um, and then we have sort of these standard ones, the, <laughs> we still have the federal assistance summary. We saw that was in there. <laughs> and then um, we have some auditor uh, extract reports as well. Uh, civil proceedings. So it has, you know, um, items relevant to that EMIS reporting. Uh, so that's what's in there. Uh, so Jen asked, so the month end bundles need to wait. Fiscal year end bundles don't need to wait if no custom bundles. The month, okay, so the SSDT month end bundle, you also don't need to wait for. So if, you, if they don't have any custom bundles at all, you can go ahead and change to current. That would apply to any month or to um, the fiscal year end because it's still going to run on the information for the month that's being closed as long as it's an SSDT bundle. It's it's only the custom bundles for any of those closed events that that don't because the SSDT ones have a special thing written in where it's it knows that it needs to be for the month that's being closed. Um, yeah, good question. All right, so then we get to our closing the fiscal year. So here are the steps for closing, uh, creating July, uh, create July. You don't have to make it current um, to start. And uh, basically, you know, especially if they're districts that are entering requisitions, I think most of them um, have July already created by the time that they go to close. You know, if they posted their budgets ahead, uh, July is going to be out there. Um, and then to close June, you go to core posting periods, click on the close icon. This is the point in time where the bundles are going to run. And then um, go ahead and make July 2024 current. And that is the actual close of the fiscal year. So last, we have our post-closing procedures here. Um, this one is uh, reviewing the audit jobs for AOS. So um, in the job scheduler, there are district audit jobs. Um, when it runs, it'll generate reports for the previous fiscal year based on the current period. So uh, basically, you probably already set these up. Here's our note. If the audit job has already been scheduled to run annually, the job does not need to be scheduled again. Um, so what I would suggest at this point, because we had these just a couple years now, it was, yeah, I think it was a couple years ago now, um, we had added these so that it sends these reports automatically to AOS. They had kind of worked with um, you at the ITC, I believe, to set up like, you know, a time when these should be sent. And when you schedule these in the job scheduler, you can use a cron job that sets them up to resend annually every year. So if you did that, what I would suggest doing at this point is just go into the job scheduler, you know, uh, double check and make sure that it looks good. You know, maybe when you're working with your districts to close, that would be like a good time if you're going in to view their data, make sure that that's all still set up to go. You know, nothing happened to that job. And then, um, and then you're good to go. So uh, if you have um, a situation where you need to set these up again, let's uh, update our our point on the, on the um, slide here. You know, I feel like every year I go through these and I'm like, I got all the years, right? Nope, there's always one. Um, so once the current period has been changed to July, 2024, then it can be scheduled to run when needed um, for the typical time of audit. So if you have, um, like if you maybe don't have this set up for some reason, you would go in and then schedule it and you're probably going to schedule it for like a future month um, to have it set up and out there. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, the other thing you may want to check is who scheduled this. You know, if it's somebody at the ITC that scheduled this, the jobs do need to have um, an active account associated with them. So if anybody, you know, if they were scheduled under somebody, um, you know, I don't know, we've seen other things where like, ITC, someone at the ITC will schedule like a report. And then if they are no longer there, then their the job may not run. So especially if these are out there for years and years, you might want to double check and make sure whoever scheduled that is still active, um, is still an active account so that it can it can run properly. So they're just good good things to check um for the end of the year. 
All right, and then so financial reporting. Um, so this is for the financial data submission. It's done through the EMIS R. Uh, the actual period age reporting is the responsibility of the district where somebody, you know, an authorized person, maybe the treasurer, maybe the EMIS coordinator, they're going to upload that EMIS extract file to the data collector, and then they're going to run that data collection process, and that's the SIF process that I talked about that actually pulls the accounts and the amounts, and then get that information submitted. So that must be submitted um, before the period age close for the fiscal year. And we have a little reminder, this used to include capital assets, but that's no longer needed. Um, what I did was I did go ahead and pull the draft schedule. So they have like these EMIS data collection calendars out there. And um, here is their website. So I just went to the website and um, actually this is this is the actual like schedule. But usually what I do is I go to their website and then they have their little search bar and I'll type uh, EMIS schedule <laughs> or EMIS timeline or something like that, but EMIS schedule will, will help you find it. Um, but here's the EMIS uh, data collection calendar. And then this has their estimated dates. So the ones relevant to us uh, for this for, for uh, this um, context, at least for USAS, is the financial collection. So here it is, financial collection, FY24H. See, so that's the period H. And so this is when they're expecting that that would open is as soon as June 3rd and then um, would close on August 30th. So, you know, they could start running, you know, preliminary ahead of time before they're closed to start looking at some of their information, uh, but they have to have it submitted before whatever the final date is here. These can change sometimes. That's why, you know, this is marked as a draft. Um, we have this marked draft here. But just for uh, your reference, this is what it's looking like at, at this current time. All right. Um, this is some more uh, some more notes kind of on what we're talking about here. So the district only needs to upload the EMIS extract file in um, the financial data source in EMIS R. When they're ready to run the collection, they'll select USAS SIP and the financial data source. And then um, the EMIS SOAP service configuration tells if it should be full account information. Um, so that's the configuration we looked at. So if that's set to 2024, even, and basically what this is saying is they're, they probably will do this after they close their fiscal year. I mean, they could do it preliminary before the fiscal year or after, but because we put 2024 in that configuration, at this point now, regardless of if they run it before they close or after they close, like it's always going to keep looking at 2024 because that's what we put in the configuration. So, um, and then, you know, I realized we actually have quite a bit about this because they do need to be aware of this for fiscal year end. Our training in two weeks, the other thing that we're going to talk about is um, what they see when they're in the data collector and some tips for actually like then making sure that what they have there, what's actually being pulled, balances back to what their figures and reports are. So we'll actually be talking about this a little bit more um, in a couple of weeks as well, more in like the the numbers and totals context. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, another extract we have is the gap extract. Again, this is in like the post-closing procedures. So after they close, they can come in here. Uh, this is going to be uh, extracts, gap. Very simple. They just select the fiscal year, submit, and it will um, give them an extract file. Um, and then, you know, they can, they would send that, you know, to their gap auditor or, you know, um, whoever is responsible for uploading the file into web gap, they would be able to generate that file um, so that they have it. Here's some of the web gap information. And then, um, you know what, let me go to, go back to our page real quick. All right, so we went, we just went through this presentation um, and then I'm gonna open the checklist here in a minute. 
Um, this one down here is the financial extraction for an ITC. So that's a process um, if like there's only specific ITCs I think that need to do this. Um, budgeting scenario steps, setting estimates uh, versus actual variances to zero. So that is like um, if they use like the classic set bell process, this is comparable to that. Again, only some districts use that. But before we finish USAS, I just wanted to quickly look at the checklist. Uh, so this is the checklist that I mentioned earlier. The presentation we just went through um, goes through basically these same steps. It's organized the same way. This has some additional links in here to the processes. And then um, I know I did make um, an update. So the, the financial detail isn't listed in here anymore. I think there's a no. Where did I put that? Hmm. Oh, here it is. Okay, so I did make a note. So as of 24, it's no longer required, will not be contained in the extract, but it's in here as an optional tool. So we did update that in the checklist to account for the difference with federal assistance summary. I know that they, um, you know, if this is something that, you know, we had the feedback the districts were still liking to fill this out because then they were using it um, later with their auditors. So you know, this is just the generic kind of checklist for um, you all to work from. But if that's something that you still want to have on on um, your checklist based on like your district's feedback, certainly understand that. But that's why I want to make sure there was still a note on here um, when it got to the EMIS extract part so that, you know, there is like a little reminder still in there. It's not just gone um, just in case they still want to, uh, you know, remember to do that. So Okay, so that is it for USAS, unless we have questions. Uh, what we have upcoming is inventory fiscal year end review. That's next. So what we'll do is take a little bit of a break and then come back and do that. Um, now, uh, before we go, though, if anybody is only here for the USAS part, I wanted to talk about um, what we have for upcoming trainings. So uh, we actually had, there was an overview for the ITCs today at the same time that we're here <laughs> for um, the employee self-service. Uh, but next week on Thursday, on May 16th, there is an ESS ITC conversion training. So um, Matt had sent out an email regarding this. Um, so if if that's something that you're interested in, um, I know I'm personally really excited for that one. I believe Matt and Mark are going to be um giving that that presentation so uh so put that on your calendar if it's not already but the ESS conversion training is on the 16th um and then again we broke these up a little bit so we're kind of seeing how this goes this year with doing you know the the USAS and inventory on um, one day and then having USPS split into a different day so USPS for fiscal year end will be next week so one week from today on May 17th um, we're going to have the payroll uh, fiscal year end uh, review. And then um, the other thing that we kind of have, so the fiscal year end information, you know, you see we talked through um, and touched on some of these subjects uh, that I'm going to get to in a minute here, but we, we talked a little bit about, you know, mentioned the MOE. Um, we talked about uh, you know, quite a bit about the prep they need to do for their period age. But then we kind of split off and we have some more detailed sessions. So for USAS, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, FYE EMIS related information. And so that's going to be on May 24th. That's kind of a follow up session where instead of just talking through the steps for fiscal year end, we're going to talk through a little bit more of some of the things that they're actually looking at. And so kind of a new thing that we're doing um, for the USAS side where we have sort of like um, a supplemental um, session with more fiscal year end related information. And then for payroll, they're having like a separate session for STRS advance. That's on June 7th. I, you know, I didn't um, put it on my list, but I think payroll is actually having an, an EMIS related uh, session after that as well. So um, if you're interested, you know, definitely visit our training page uh, where you would have registered for this session. So I'm sure you are all familiar, uh, but that's what it's looking like. So. Um, 
I'll stop talking and let you all take a break or head out if you're heading out. Uh, thank you so much for attending the USAS session. Uh, let's take about a 10 minute break and at 10 15, we will reconvene. Um, you know, everybody gets, some, I know I'm getting some more coffee. <laughs> um, we will reconvene and then we will go into the inventory fiscal year end. Thank you. All right. And we're, and we're back. <laughs> So we will go ahead and continue on. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the inventory fiscal year and close uh, next. Um, you know what? Uh, thank you so much, Pat, for having my back. So actually I updated this, uh, this STRS session that I just mentioned at the end of our USAS presentation is actually on June 14th. Uh, June 7th, if you, you can still show up that day, we have our release recap um, on June 7th. But if you're looking for the STRS advance uh, training, that will actually be on June 14th. So whoops. <laughs> um, I, I figured too, while, while I was uh, at it, I'm just going to go back to our um, ITC training registration page and uh, just scroll a little bit here. Um, because here we are, so we have our um, fiscal year and review that we are in right now, um, and then USPS, and here's STRS Advance. Um, where is, let's see, um, oh, they are, the EMA session is a little bit later. It's, it's in July that I mentioned, that's the USPS one, but their reporting happens um, a little bit later, uh, I think. I uh, hope I'm not misspeaking on that. <laughs> so that so that session's a little bit far out. We have a couple more USAS ones too. So, you know, I won't overwhelm you with trainings, but I just figured I'd come look at all the stuff we have coming up here. I'm actually very excited for our trainings this summer. You know, this next one that we're doing is uh, a bit different. Um, and then we have some of our, our staples over the summer. So uh, with, with doing reports, uh, we're actually mixing it up with the reports this time. So, all right, I'm getting me off track. All right, so uh, for inventory, again, I'm starting on this same page. This is going to be under the meetings and trainings. Um, and then we have our 2024 ITC fiscal year end meeting page. I'm just scrolling down here underneath where USAS is. <clears throat> and we have our inventory fiscal year end section. Um, this does have the fiscal year end review uh, PowerPoint that we're going to go through. And then uh, that coordinates with the fiscal year end checklist that is in the documentation for those um, generic closing procedures. Uh, so those kind of go hand in hand. So for, for visual, we're gonna take a look at it through the um, PowerPoint lens. So here we go. Our first page, again, um, if you are just referring back to this document or to this presentation later, this has a link to that meetings and trainings page where we found this. All right. All right, so we'll get rolling right in then. Um, for pre-closing procedures for inventory, um, what they're gonna do is they're gonna, they wanna finish all of their current year processing. So getting all of the items in for the year, um, items that are received on or prior to Ju June 30th of 24 should be added to their inventory for fiscal year 2024. Items received after June 30th, so if they have invoice items and then they have, um, they were actually received with a later date, they could still be pulled over into the inventory pending file for 2025. They just wouldn't make those into items yet with like 2024 dates. Um, we have a note here as well, if the, the, the depreciation has been changed on several items so that it's necessary to completely recalculate the life to date depreciation, uh, there is a depreciate option um, on the items grid. So um, let's see, it will, uh, so this basically affects items that had additional acquisitions added throughout the life of the item. If the, L, uh, the LTD, the life to date depreciation um, needs to be like recalculated, basically, it basically recalculates it from scratch based on what exists in the system. Um, if you are going to do this, there is a projection report um, that it would generate prior to making the change. 
So um, definitely run that projection report, review all of those items, make sure that that is something that um, you're actually intending to do and change all the items that um, appear on the report prior to not doing the projection. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, so here's a note. Recalculating depreciation will affect items that have had improvements, additional acquisitions added throughout the life of the item, causing the items to lose their true depreciation history. So um, if this is something you're looking into, refer to the depreciation chapter in the appendix. So uh, this PowerPoint has links all throughout it to uh, more information in the documentation. So if this is something you're looking at doing, definitely read through that depreciation chapter. Um, or depreciation adjustments could also be entered, and there's a section there as well. So if this is something that needs to be done, these are excellent resources that you should um, review. Okay. And then um, next for pre-closing, so make sure items that meet or exceed the entity's capitalization threshold are marked as capitalized um, on the items grid, you can add this capitalized column and filter using the cap threshold. Um, if there are items that meet the threshold but are marked false, they need to be looked into further as for why they're not capitalized. So let's go in here. So I'm in uh, just an inventory um, test instance. And if I go to the items grid, actually, you know what? We're, we're going to go to the items grid, but I want to go one more place first. Let's go to system. Capitalization criteria. This, um, I don't believe everybody can see this. Um, definitely not everybody can change this, but um, as far as seeing this, like I'm in an admin account right now, so I can see everything. But if you have like a standard user, I'm not sure. Um, so this will give the fiscal year. And, um, and again, I'm just in a random test instance. So pretend this is 2024. And then it'll have the capitalization amount and the life limit. This actually is for changing it, but this is a nice quick reference. The other place you can see this, if you go to fiscal years, it'll have the dollar limit and life limit for that specific, for the current um, fiscal year as well. So two places you can see that. So when we're looking at this slide and it says, you know, come in here and filter on the original cost and the life expectancy, that's what you're comparing it to is whatever the capitalization criteria is set to. So let's look at this. If we come in here and okay, and we have it on here. So our capitalized, and then we also want to make sure original cost. Life expectancy, that's the last one we're looking for. Okay. So uh, we'll make sure that those are on our grid. Move these over a little bit. Okay. So once we have these on our grid, so then this is where this is where we're seeing. So in. Um, In this instance, it was 3,000, so put greater than 299. And I think our years, well, we'll just say for this, let's say greater than one, just as an example. And um, so then we could go look through this. Let's look at just active items and make sure that if they should be capitalized, they are capitalized. Again, if, if you find something that's not, then um, you'd want to investigate further um, look into further why they're not capitalized. But, you know, basically like those capitalized items will go through and um, be updated if there are any changes to the cap criteria. So that's a good check. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about while we're here is I want to look at the actual items. Um, and these things, once we get to the reports, we're going to be talking about capitalized items. Like these things are going to come back. So we're going to do a little item overview here while we're here to look at things that are gonna be um, used later. So I wanna look at, um, when we're looking at an item, and I've just kind of picked a random one here. Um, if we view the item information, what I wanna point out is this current information here, we have the fund, the function, and the asset class. 
So these three fields are designated to the item, basically when it's created, um, or there's a way that they can be changed. Um, but but basically these are, I think of these as like categories that these are, that each item is put into. And we'll talk more about the fund because I know that that can be a little bit confusing sometimes, but like say the asset class. So each item is designated to a specific asset class. In this case, this one says it's furniture, fixtures, and equipment. So this item falls under that category. So that's how we're going to classify it. And then um, what where this is going to become important, and I'm sure uh, most of you have looked at the reports and have seen how the reports can be uh, basically sorted by each of these different groupings. So um, when we start looking at the reports and it has these totals for each asset class, what those totals are specifically made up of is any items that have this asset class marked on them. And um, if you keep that in mind, that can be really helpful then if you have like, okay, well, this asset class is not what I expect the amount to be, then we want to look at all the items that would be in that asset class. So, you know, kind of a way to work backwards and get the detail based on, you know, how your reports down the line are um, are broken out. So, so okay, so on each item, we have a fund, a function, and an asset class. Okay, now the other thing here, and I think I had them on here, is, uh, let me pull these over, is I can add those to my item grid, fund, function, asset class. So they were already on my grid, but if I scroll down here, fun function asset class, which that's funny, they're, they're not checked, but but they're on my grid, so it's fine. So if you needed to add these, you could check them and add them to your item grid. I, I When I help with uh, balancing issues, when I help with balancing questions on tickets, I have used this quite often because it's nice if you're looking at um, you know, a report that's by asset class and, and you're like not expecting this one total to be something for some reason, you're trying to drill down why is that the total? Well, I could come in here and filter to only look at the items that are within that asset class. And that helps me kind of break down the group of items that I'm looking at so that I can maybe find if there's one item that needs to be looked into. So this is really helpful uh, to add those to the item grid. Um, and then uh, what I have next here is basically where are these coming from? So, you know, we're seeing, we saw that 0300 asset class was for uh, furniture and fixtures. But if we come to this core menu, we have asset class, we have fund and we have function. So when I look at this, um, this could be different for each district. These are defined by each district. So whatever they have, what, like there are certain, you know, uh, specs like that, you know, how many digits they have to be and that sort of thing. But whatever descriptions they have could be unique. Um, we see all kinds of different codes or level of detail that are used, you know, maybe for the functions. Um, but these can be unique based on whatever district that you are that you're looking into. So this is a good reference here. Um, the other thing, if we look at the funds, so the other thing that is important here, when these funds are set up, so it has a fund code, it has a description, and then each fund also has this fund type. So in this case, it says governmental. When we start looking at the reports, you'll see the reports are broken down. They have groups for governmental, proprietary, and fiduciary. And so when we see on the reports, these are the governmental amounts. That's directly saying, okay, why is it governmental? It's governmental because the item in that category that when it, when you look at the item, whatever fund is on that item has governmental listed as the type. So that's just helpful if you need to trace back like something's not in the category you expect. Well, if I had something that is showing under proprietary, but I think it should be showing under governmental, I want to go look at the item and see what fund it has. And then I want to come to this grid and see how that fund is set up. So 
uh, just kind of where, you know, when we get into these, this will, I'm just trying to trace like where, how these information or how the information is going to relate. Um, okay, so those are set up in the core menu. And then uh, the other thing I want to talk about, because this is a common question that we get, um, is talking about basically like source versus fund code. Okay. So if we look at the funds, this is um, the documentation page for the fund. We have this description up here, and then this gives some more information on those types that we were talking about. But this is important. Funds are used to deter to define the item's current fund for which an item is currently being used. And then the fund code is not necessarily the source from which the item was purchased. Okay, so when we're looking at items, each item is just its own thing, right? So, oops, no, I want that. So each item, this is my tag number, this is my item information, each item has a fund, it can only have one fund on the item. So every item is only ever going to be associated with one fund. That one fund should be in line with how is the item being used, okay? Now, where this can be confusing is if we go to the acquisition record, and of course I picked one that only has one, if we go to the acquisition, so each item could have multiple acquisitions, like it could have, so say an item has like three different acquisitions and each of those acquisitions is from like a purchase order and that could have a different account code on it. So the item could have been purchased out of three different like USAS account code funds, but ultimately it's only going to have one fund like category, like one fund um, assigned on the item. And I know that can be confusing and it's a little bit hard to explain, <laughs> but basically what I'm saying is when you're looking at the fund, um, when we split up the reports by fund, when you're looking at the fund on the item, I again, I like to think of that as a way that it's being categorized, not necessarily thinking of that as like, yes, this is exactly where this was charged. So fund, function, asset class, to me, those are groupings. That's a way that I'm organizing this to be able to see it. Um, there are some reports that do take into account where it was actually purchased from in this account code, and we'll talk about those. We're going to talk about a couple of those today. But um, but that is something that is a difference. So let's go back to this. So just to recap, you know, um, each item. So the item's only going to have one fund code, but the acquisition, but it could have multiple acquisitions that have different accounts that it was charged for. So they're two separate things. And then most of the reports that sort by fund are using the fund code from the item. The exceptions are reports that reference source. So whenever you see a report that says source, that's when it's actually looking at the acquisition and where it was charged on the PO. So uh, yeah, so that's important to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that we'll look at, let's go back to our item real quick here. Uh, here, let's just look at this one. Just pick a random one here. The other thing is this original cost over here. So the original cost, oh, okay, there we go. <laughs> so uh, the original cost, oh, that's funny, it's got me in the, okay, let me be in edit. Okay, the original cost um, of the item, is basically the sum of all the acquisition amounts. It can't be manually changed. It'll always be the total of the existing acquisitions. Okay, hang on. Just gonna... Needs me to sign into my Google account and my notes are there too. So, you know, <laughs> do that real quick. <laughs> Alrighty, convenient timing, you know. 
Um, and then the other reason that this is important is it's part of what determines the capitalization of the item. So, you know, when we looked at looking at those items that were capitalized and we said, okay, you know, here's what the threshold is. Well, the threshold is based on what that original cost is. So this original cost is important. When we start looking at the reports, we're also going to see our totals for original cost. So I just want to look at this while we're on the item and say, this is what the original cost is. Basically, this is adding up all of the amounts for all of the acquisitions that are associated with this item. The other field we want to look at here is the life to date depreciation. So this is down in the depreciation information section. And um, the life to date depreciation is the total amount of de depreciation uh, for the item from the beginning depreciation date until the last fiscal year closed. So um, beginning date. And then the last year that was closed, so basically like as years are created and closed, it's going to add amounts to this life to date depreciation. Now, again, I'm sort of in a test instance, so um, I don't have any in here, but there are there is a, a grid here that shows like each time a year is closed, it'll basically have like an internal entry that tells you the, the amount like for that fiscal year. Um, so that you can kind of see year to year, like what is being added to this life to date depreciation total. This is also something that we're going to reference with the report totals that we talk about as well. Okay. I'm trying to refresh this and see. Oh, yeah, good. Okay, so, so now that we've kind of done a little bit of like preliminary looking on the items, let's start talking about the uh, closing procedures. So um, big part with inventory is really running and reviewing the reports. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and talk through those. Um, so uh, once all the assets have been entered for the fiscal year, the district can run the recommended list of reports. This includes all necessary gap reports if gap is, is enabled for the entity. Um, all recommended fiscal year end reports are explained in the upcoming slides. So the first category we're gonna talk about is the gap reports. Um, again, these, uh, oh, actually wait, yeah, this one is, it does have a link to the documentation. This one's to like the very top of this gap reports page. And then um, as you can see, this is gonna break down each of the different reports in the in the gap report section and we're going to talk through these uh but first i want to talk about this part right at the top here so um the gap reports uh are canned reports that are located under the reports menu they're generated in pdf format only they contain separate sections for each fund type so again we looked at that we saw where that's coming from governmental proprietary fiduciary and the gap reports only show items that meet certain criteria. This is important to keep in mind. These reports will automatically be filtering to only include um, items that are capitalized and then items that um, don't have one of these three statuses. They're not disposed of, they're not inactive, and they're not an old tag. So like basically active, but also like active, new item, like there's a couple other ones that are, are not these. Um, and then items coded as operating leases. So that, that's what's excluded. Um, why this is important is when we look at the gap reports, that's just a subset of items that qualify. So um, then when we start looking at non-gap reports, if you're trying to like balance those, you have to keep in mind that these gap reports are going to be automatically filtered. So when you run non-gap reports, you have to filter those the same way. <laughs> Um, if you want them to balance. So uh, so that's where that is defined and uh, something we want to keep in mind. All right, um, let, let's go to our instance real quick here. Uh, so I just want to point this out. Reports, the gap reports that we're talking about are all on this little... Um, like menu options. So reports, and then this opens the gap reports in the separate little tab. And these are the four gap reports that we're gonna talk about. So those are kind of a subset that are grouped together here. The first one we're talking about is this fixed asset by source report. And um, hang on, let me get over here. 
Um, so this is where this is where I want to show you because I'm not going to do this for every single one. But if you're back here referring to these, these do have links to the section for each individual report. So fixed asset by source. And then this has a lot of good information in here. Uh, we do also have um, the recording. This recording, I think, is from last year. I, Michelle did do a new overview training this year, but we don't have it broken down yet by like the sections. So, uh, you know, you could access it through here or if you want to go to the 2024 um, overview session to look at more information about these reports, um, you can do that as well. But I kind of I just left this in here for a quick reference. So uh, so basically this report. Now, the first thing we're seeing fixed asset by source. What do we say? Source means that it's actually going to look at the account code where it was purchased and not just that like fund group. So um, this is a summary of the original cost of capitalized items by their source uh, or fund of the items that were charged on the purchase order. So source being um, the fund the items were originally charged to when purchased. It uses the PO information from the acquisition record to identify the source fund used in purchasing the items. So uh, let's go, you know what, maybe I do want to do this so that we can look at it. So uh, here is um, our little screenshot. And so if you see this report is broken down by the fund type um, and so governmental, but, but basically when like, here's an example, this has the 501. I can zoom just a little bit more, see if that's bigger sorry it's a little bit blurry but so what's nice is this screenshot has everything we need together so this pop out right here is the acquisition the account code remember we saw the account code that was um entered on the acquisition so this says here's where this item was purchased from here's where this acquisition um for at least whatever amount that's associated with this acquisition of the item um was purchased from is 501 and then what it's going to do is it's going to reference whatever fund type that is like it's still it does use like the types defined on the funds um and then it's going to put it in the category based on that so if the district is looking for something that says okay you know where i want to see like the amounts by where they're purchased from this is going to be the report for that uh fixed assets by source basically when when we get this question it's because they're looking at the item and it only shows one fund and they're like well i have amounts you know half from this fund half from that fund how come i can't pick more than one and so true you can't pick more than one on the item and what it's used for but as long as you have an acquisition for each of those account codes when you run certain reports like this one it will be able to show those amounts in the separate sections. So um, that the other thing that um, I would refer to with this is there's a section how amounts are included on the report. And these basically go through the different situations. So if you have a question about like, well, why is it putting uh, this amount from this item in this section? it goes through the different scenarios and tells you what it's gonna look at. So like in this example, again, this is the acquisition, the account code was left with zeros. So if that's the case, it's going to look at the fund from the item. And then here it's going to that core fund grid and looking at the type, how we talked about, and that's how it's just deciding that that's where it goes on the report. So I won't go through all of them, but there are other scenarios here and it goes through each. So if you have a question on this report and why something is in the section that it is, I would highly recommend going and referring to that and kind of walking through that with what the example is that you have. That can be very helpful. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about fixed assets by function and class. Uh, so this is um, basically your schedule of fixed assets. It's going to be categorized by the function and, and the class and the asset class categories. Um, you may generate up to three different report formats, and we recommend for fiscal year end to generate the report for um, all three. So uh, what these are showing is, so here's the schedule by function and class. It displays the original cost and the book value. 
And then this is going to be, you know, so then by class, um, and then a summary version by function and class. So choose to summarize by two digit function. And um, you may report on the original cost or the book value. So the book value, this part's important, the original cost minus the total depreciation. So remember, we looked at those fields, we saw the original cost on the items. So essentially what this report is doing, grouping items by those groups by function and class. And then it's also going to show you the total of all of the original cost on those items for each and the book value. Schedule of change in fixed assets. So what this one is going to show you here, let's let's look at this one. Um, oh, actually, you know what? We do have a, hang on, we have a screenshot in the presentation for this one. Just kidding. So this contains changes in the capital assets during the current fiscal year. Um, this is the one that you've seen where it has the beginning balance and the ending balance. When you're in summary version, that's what you get. And um, so you have a summary or a detail report that you can run for it. Uh, and then you could generate this by asset class, by fund, or by function. So you choose when you run this, which of those three categories you want it to be broken down by. Um, and then let's go here. So the summary report list, uh, let me see. Hmm. Okay, I like it better here. So this top one here is the summary. And see, we have the beginning value, acquisition amount, disposition amount, transfers, transfer out, and adjustment. So when we're talking about fixed, so fixed asset, and we're talking about beginning value, we're talking about original cost. So when, again, we saw that original cost field, um, that is made up of like what the acquisitions were for that item, right? So whatever the original cost was as a beginning value for the year is going to be totaled up. And in this case, we ran it by asset class, totaled up and represented in this column. Now, the original cost, remember I said, you can't manually edit that. The only way that you can add to that is by adding an acquisition, right? So any acquisitions that happened within the current year are going to be adding to whatever the total original cost is. So those acquisitions, the total of all of those are here. Uh, if the item was disposed of, that would reduce uh, what the value is. So then that, that's gonna be the disposition amount. Uh, transfers, you have in and out. Um, remember I said you can change those categories on the item. So like if you change it from one asset class to another, then you would have, okay, transfer in, it was added to this one and you'd have like a counteracting one somewhere else for the one that it was changed from. So that just means it moved where, which category it's showing under essentially. And then if there's an adjustment amount, which um, those are uh, certain changes will uh, show as an adjustment. So uh, what, this is, what this is showing here is that this is one big calculation. When you're looking at this report, Hang on, I locked my lamp. <laughs> Excuse me. Hang on. Read the wrong way there. All right. So, um, just a minute. There we go. We have light. So uh, this is one big calculation. So when you're looking at these figures, um, like let's just look at just this one um, category here. So we have the beginning value, and then that's going to add any acquisitions, and that's acquisitions that are dated within the fiscal year that we're looking at, right? Because the beginning was where we were at at the very start of this year. Acquisitions is anything added. This could be on existing items, or this could be new items. Um, anything that was disposed of is going to be subtracted from that total. Transfers in or added, transfers out or subtracted. And then ultimately what that's going to give you is the ending balance. And so essentially, you know, where you started, any changes that happened in the year and where you're ending. So that is the summary. That's what the summary is going to show you. 
Now the detail version is a little bit different. So we have an example here. You can see there are these totals on the side that give me the beginning and ending balance. But what we're actually gonna see for the detail is only what happened within the current year. So in this case, this is an example of this 001 change in fixed, or yeah, change in fixed assets. So uh, this asset class, we saw the acquisitions changed. We had an acquisition by this amount. So this acquisition was for this amount and this one was in the current year that it's looking at. Uh, but see, notice like the beginning value is made up of everything before that year. So you're only seeing in detail view the things that happened in these middle columns, basically. All right. So, um, and then since we mentioned on all of those, we talked about original cost, right? So on these three reports, the original cost amounts should match when balancing out for fiscal year end. Um, now, the one thing to note, though, is that is the totals, right? Um, we, when we're looking at like the individual groupings, you know, we have this one is by function in class. This one you can run by fund function, um, or asset class. The fixed assets by source is taking things into account a little bit differently. So I wouldn't expect that, that the funds within this one are going to hundred percent match if you run this one by a fund because these, these two at the bottom here are running by like whatever is defined on the item. And then remember this source is where it was charged. Now the grand total should still balance because overall your original cost for the grand total is still gonna be the same. It's just basically like, where is it showing it? That's the difference on these reports. Where is it showing it as far as what category? How's it grouping it for you? All right. And then we have, um, this is the last gap report that we're talking about, is the schedule of changes in depreciation. So this one is different. It's similar to the last one that we talked about, but what it's different in the way of is what information it's showing. So um, this contains information by fund, function, or asset class on capitalized assets tracking depreciation. It displays additions, dispositions, transfers, and adjustments that cause changes in the depreciation balances of the fixed assets. So basically, what we're seeing here, um, and this has a lot of similarities to the previous report where we have summary or detail. When we click over, you'll notice that the overall layout with the summary and detail is the same. So it's the same concept. But the figures we're seeing is the depreciation. So where's the beginning depreciation? Um, the items that are continuing and the depreciation for those. Um, and then any acquisitions that happened within the current year. But again, these figures represent the depreciation on those, not original cost. So this is different. So this loops back to um, that life to date depreciation field what that life state depreciation was to start um, and then basically like where it's going. Amanda, can I ask a question at this yes. point? Yes. So this is, this is probably everybody's going to be like, Oh my gosh, you've been sitting through the whole training and now you're asking this, but like when you run this report mm -hmm. and it's in FY 24, is mm -hmm. this showing you what has happened prior or this is going to show you like, when does the depreciation actually like increase in here? Does Good that part. make sense? Like, yeah. Yeah. So the depreciation is going to like, it's actually going to add additional depreciation when the fiscal year closes. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. For, like for the new year. Um, let me make sure. I'm so like, right. Cause yeah. it's like changes in depreciation. Is it showing you like, okay, this is what will happen when you close the FY 24, or this is where we're at right now as of FY 23. Um, let me hang on. Let me see just to know what I'm lo looking right. at on this one. Right. Cause you're no, saying, you're saying on the item, if I go look at the item, the LT, the life to date, 
that's as of the fiscal year, the last one that's been closed. So if I go look at one right now and it says, you know, we've got 100K in depreciation, it's like that's as of FY23. When you close FY24, you know, an extra, you know, 10K is going to get thrown on there. I get that. But like the, yeah. the reports are kind of confusing because you run them in an open fiscal year. Right. But like, yeah. Um, let me see. So, you know, it's a, it's a good question. And, and I, honestly, you have me questioning it too, because I understand how it's confusing. Um, let's, why don't we go run one and let's go from there because I want to make sure that I don't explain it wrong. <laughs> so, um, let's, we'll see how this goes again. I'm in, I'm in a, I'm in an old fiscal year, so ignore that. But, um, because, okay, because this is, oh, Well, let's hope we can. Um, well, that's unfortunate. Maybe my test instance can't do this, sorry. Oh, we'll try it one more time. All right, uh, it's just my instance. So, uh, new plan. Is that an older, is that an older instance? Cause I think, yeah. I feel like I remember that bug from yeah. like last year and then it's fixed now though, I'm pretty sure, but. Yeah, it is. Yeah. This is an old instance that is definitely not updated. And I'll, I'll be, I was only planning on showing items in here. So that's why I didn't really um, update it. So, so let's go back to this. Let's go look at this though, because, um, all right. The beginning depreciation, and you know what I want to compare to here is, um, I'm trying to decide if I want to jump ahead. Because basically what I would do is I would compare this one to the book value report. And when we're looking at that, the book value report has, um, it'll show you like the life to date depreciation. Uh, let's go. There. so you're saying there's another report right there's one that shows you here's your current here's what's going to get added here's what it's going to be right that's like there's very that straightforward well. yeah but the book value kind of okay so when we start talking about these non-gap reports um these are going to show kind of like a more detailed view of items that kind of make up the different totals and so if we look at this one so this one has uh, your life to date depreciation here and then the year to date depreciation and the total depreciation. So I'm trying to remember on the fly which one of these matches which, and that's where I wanted to run them and look at them. Um, but what I will say is that when we're looking at this, so you have your beginning depreciation and that's where the life to date started. The items that continue, you know what? This is what we need to do. This is what we need to do is I think there is a calculation. Here we go. Okay, beginning depreciation is equal to the value of the life to date depreciation for active capitalized items at the beginning of the fiscal year. Items that have been transferred are reported online for the original fund. Continuing items is the fiscal to date depreciation for active items that were capitalized at the beginning of the year. Fiscal to date depreciation on newly created items is what you see in acquisition. So when you're looking at this, like acquisitions and dispositions is like actually, okay, there was like new acquisitions added. But what this is saying is that um, the continuing items, so this second column, so like this is at the start of the fiscal year, what the life to date would be. Continuing items is going to be with the fiscal to date depreciation on it. So yeah, I believe that is like what's going to be added at for okay. the end of the year. So then this is- They where just have different out. titles. They just have different titles than the book value report. I guess I'm, the right. book value one is one that I'm more, I'm more familiar with that. Like I said, that's what okay. I run when I'm confused and yeah. trying to help somebody. Yeah. Um, so it just has different words. I assume that's for like gap purposes, right? Like they yeah. want it to be called that. Okay. Yeah. 
And you know what? You're so right, though. That's what we see. And that's why I was going to the book value report, because I feel like when I look at that one, I'm like, oh, OK. And then I compare them. Yeah. Down. I'm like, oh, OK, here's what we're looking at. But here's a yeah, this this was the section we needed, I think, because I see um, that right here. Yeah. This one right here ending amount at the end of the year. This is a calculated figure. And so and that's where I totally get the confusion because you're like, OK, well, I'm looking at this like and I and uh, when you're looking at this within fiscal year 24, you haven't closed yet. Like that's your open year. You're looking at that report thinking, OK, well, is this where I'm at now? And technically, no because you haven't actually closed yet. But when you close and the depreciation is actually calculated at that close, this is where it's gonna be. Thank you, that makes so much sense. And just one quick, I think the answer to this is very easy. If you're not doing anything funny, you just don't, you don't have to click depreciate. Like it just depreciates and moves forward. The only time you have to do that is when you're like, messing around with something to make it work like right like it right. was wrong like when it got entered in or something yeah okay yeah it's like something's not looking right and maybe like um honestly i feel like a lot of times when we see that it's because maybe like something was like imported like loaded you know like um, yeah. when we're setting them up and then having to do it like yeah it's not something that i would expect that you're using regularly like you, you know the year end good awesome okay thank you so much yeah, no problem. No, that that was a great question. I'm glad we talked that out. Uh, I'm I'm sad that I can't run it in my instance, but that's on me. I should have prepared a, a newer instance. <laughs> um, all right. So then we go to these non-gap reports, and so um, kind of similar to like what we were just talking about with the book value is these non-gap reports. So these aren't like the specific ones are being reported, but these are still really helpful to run at um, fiscal year end because they can kind of give you like more detail to what you're looking at and like a different view. So, you know, again, just to flip back real quick to this um, gap to the summary or to the schedule of change and depreciation, the summary has the totals. When you run the detail, the detail is only showing the things that changed in the year. But if you want any detail on like, okay, well, where did it start? What's the beginning total made of? What's everything in that total? That's where you're going to use some of these non-GAAP reports. So the first one is asset listing by grant source is a listing of the acquisition transaction data by the source account code or the grant identifier. So again, source. So that's not talking about whatever fund is just on the item. That is what account it was actually charged to. If they want to see the information of where, you know, where was this item purchased from, what's the purchase order associated with and what are the amounts for those, you know, that was for each account code it was charged to in USAS, this asset listing by grant source report can give you more detail on that. Um, so this one kind of like pairs with that fixed asset by source gap report, but this can be additional information. The brief, uh, brief asset listing has one line per item of all assets or subsets of them. So um, there's five different versions for fiscal year end that you can run here that are recommended to run. Um, so these include, uh, oh, and then this, when you're running this, um, this is a suggestion, include capital, capitalized items only and the status codes of active, new, you can go through and select these when, um, you are running the report in the parameters. What this does, remember we talked about the gap reports only include, like they're automatically filtered to only have capitalized items and only have items that are not disposed of, old item or um, whatever the third one was. So these are the statuses where this is what is being included in the gap reports. So if you run the brief asset listing, filter the report this way, then that's going to have it so that you're looking at the same items that are being included in the totals for your gap reports. Um, and then you can see like, basically the reason that there's different versions of this is, okay, so this one is, is grouping it by fund. This one's grouping it by function. This one's grouping it by asset class. And then if you have your acquisitions and your dispositions for the current fiscal year, Basically, that's giving you the detailed view of like what you would see on the fixed assets on the, the schedule of change and fixed assets report. 
So the reason it's nice to run and save these along with like your fiscal year end is like, so that's a good reference, you know, to have of what, what those totals are made up of. Um, book value report. So similar in my mind, at least to like a brief asset where it breaks down the detail um, on one of those schedule of change reports, but this one for depreciation. So it has depreciation um, information. It, it does include the original cost, the savage value, has the book value. Uh, we saw it, it has the, um, I think I just saw it pulled up, no. But we saw this one has the, here, let's click on it. We'll go there. Where's our little screenshot at? Um, so it's here, you know, that's a little bit small, but see, you can see it has, um, the life to date depreciation column, a year to date depreciation and total depreciation. And then that calculates out the book value, which remember we said the book value was the original cost minus the total depreciation. So this kind of gives you a detail. And and these, I think of these two book value and brief as, asset listing when I'm, you know, when someone's questioning one of the totals on one of those gap reports, these are two resources that I go to to be able to break down and say like, okay, this is what's being included in that total. Now let me look at each item and make sure that the information on each item is, is what you would expect it to be. Or if there's a difference, you can figure out where that is. Um, other non-GAAP reports, the audit report tracks changes made in the application. We kind of have this one. And I think on the um, checklist too, it says like, you know, run the official version. Um, I would say, okay, so it's not bad to run the audit report, but probably when, when you're actually going through the close, like, especially if you try and run this for the whole year, this could be a large report. I think this one's still taking a long time to, you know, still taking quite a while to run for a lar large uh, data set. So they could run this. Um, it runs, it's going to run in the fiscal year end bundle. And it probably is better to just have it run in the bundle so that it ha it can just complete in the background. Um, if there's a reason they want to run this, they can. But I would say, you know, if, you, if they're having trouble running this manually, I, I don't think that they necessarily need to also have like a manual copy that they've run because this is going to be included when they close their year. It'll run it for the year. Uh, one thing important to note on the audit report is the date ranges are going to represent like the date that transactions were actually entered, like the the date that the um, change was made, not what the item is dated for. So if you have districts that are like retroactively closing previous years, uh, you know, or like if you're entering items for, you know, um, for I don't know a year basically a previous year like it's not going to go it's not running for the transactions that are definitely in that year it's running for changes that were made in the system within the last year's time so just when you're looking at that keep that in mind the depreciation posting report so this is the other one um it, this kind of came up this has a projected fiscal to date depreciation and book value amounts sorted and subtotaled by asset fund with a grand total at the bottom. So that's another one that you can look at as far as like when the year is closed and the depreciation gets posted, that that's going to give the projected um, fiscal to date depreciation amount. And there's also a fiscal year end ending balances report. This has the projected ending, which projected original cost for the current fiscal year. Um, so those are kind of some preliminary reports. Those, if you are familiar with classic, those were like the EIS CLS, EIS closed, um, counterpart. All right. So then once you get through the reports, um, just make sure I got everything here. Uh, we go to our, uh, closing steps. So close the current fiscal year by clicking the close icon in core fiscal years. So we can look at this real quick. So we go here and we have the close icon. Um, so we just click that to close it. Um, what this is going to do, it's going to advance the last closed fiscal year date in the configuration by one year. It'll add one year's worth of depreciation to that life-to-date depreciation field. So remember we, when we talked about that field, 
that is always going to show the total up until the last closed year. So basically whatever year is showing here, and then the life to date field is going to show the amount through that. And it'll have like the amount showing what it was for this year in that little uh, grid. And the reason that it's kind of stated like this is because you technically can go back and like, you know, view a previous year, you know, the, the years aren't um, as strict um, as like, you know, in classic, you were only in one year at a time. So this is, so this is how to know, you know, what that's representative of if you have a district that's got maybe multiple years. Um, updates, uh, so this updates the beginning balance fields for the new fiscal year on the item record. So um, that beginning balance for the year is gonna be updated. And then it generates the inventory fiscal year end bundle. So um, it generates the necessary reports. Uh, this is still going to be emailed this year. So it's going to send a zip file to the email address that is set in the core configuration. Um, we do have plans for that document storage. They are still working on it at this point. Um, and once that is ready, uh, in inventory, we do have plans where it'll have a file archive that these reports can generate and then be sent to the file archive. But for this year, where we're at right now, um, it'll be the email again. It was like that, you know, same process as last year. And uh, just have that zip file emailed to, you know, someone at the district, someone at the ITC, and then, um, you know, whichever, it doesn't have to be specifically either one or both, just, you know, whatever um, you, you determine and then save that zip file for the future. All right, so then um, once that, uh, once the year is closed, um, the next step is to create the new fiscal year, open the year, make it current to start processing inventory in the new year. Um, and the second one is like a note, this, I don't think this will be the norm, but if the gap flag is not enabled and an entity would like to start on gap for the next fiscal year, um, the ITC intervention is required, so the ITC would set this up, and here's the steps. So enable the gap flag in core configuration, and um, once enabled, they can start using it. So this is just like the process if somebody's not using gap and they're going to. Um, if you have districts that are already, you know, already enabled, already using gap, you don't need to do anything for this. You don't have to do this every year. This is just uh, if they need to start. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so that brings us to the end of inventory. We did it. Um, do we have any other questions? All right. Well, um, just in case anybody wasn't here um, earlier, I think you all were though, uh, we have some upcoming trainings. So we have um, the ESS ITC conversion training that is going to be on May 16th. So that is next week on uh, Thursday. And then our USPS fiscal year end review is going to be on May 17th. That is Friday. And we have a couple additional sessions after that related to fiscal year end items. Um, so that's what we've got coming up. Thank you all so much for attending today. Um, I hope that, that you liked this with uh, kind of splitting up USAS and USPS. Um, when you close out of the Zoom, there is going to be a little survey that pops up in the browser. Please give us feedback and let us know what you think about having these uh, on separate days, because we definitely want to know that for uh, for next year to see if this is a good way to do it or not. So, so let us know. Yes, have a great weekend. Happy Mother's Day this weekend. Oh, good. Alyssa, you like splitting the meetings up? Okay, awesome. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, have a good one. Thanks so much for attending and we will see you next time. All right. Bye.